there's been a huge uptick in phishing on mobile devices in excess of 50 percent. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and the criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, my conversation with Alex Mosher. He's from Mobile Iron. And we're going to be talking about a campaign they ran recently that I was sort of part of. It was their (laughs) Fishing with Cookies campaign. Have you ever been to security training? We have. What's it been like for you? If you're like us, ladies and gentlemen, it's the annual compliance drill, a few hours of PowerPoint in the staff break room. Refreshments in the form of sugary donuts and tepid coffee are sometimes provided, but a little bit of your soul seems to die every time the trainer says, Next slide. Well, okay, we exaggerate, but you know what we mean. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before, who have a different way of training. All right, Joe, before we get going, I have a quick story to share about my mom almost being scammed again. Really? (laughs) So I was over at my parents' place uh, doing a little uh, what I call Dave's Free Unlimited Lifetime Tech Support (laughs) and um, helping them with some issues. And and as part of this, my father and I had just we decided we're going to run out and run a little errand together. We came back to his house and my mom was there in the kitchen and she's she's staring at her phone and she says, I've got a situation here. <laughs> it's like, okay, what? All right, what's going on, mom? Calm down, calm down. What's the mess? She's all worked up. And she was at the point in a scam where she was about to call the scammers back with her PIN number for her Verizon account. Ah, now this is interesting because this is the second time they've gone off to your parents' Verizon account. Yes. <laughs> so, and I, I I don't know all the details because it really wasn't worth, it was more important to, to basically talk my mom off the ledge than it was to get all the details. But it seems as though the bad guys left a message, you know, that said, it's important you return our call. Your account has been compromised, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, she called and they said, okay, we're going to trigger this thing that's going to send you a PIN number. When you get the PIN number, call us back at this number with the PIN number and we'll we'll secure your account. And of course, this is a scam. Right. <laughs> Verizon doesn't need to call you to get your PIN number. No. Uh, <laughs> so lucky to walk in on it right at the moment when when it could have gone bad, but she was just along for the ride. She was at that moment where she was about to sort of give up the ball game there. That's interesting. Did you take the opportunity to educate her on this? You know, not to sound like condescending or anything, but, you know, it, it seems like you said she's along for the ride. She's she's in on it and she's she's essentially gotten hooked. I mean, how do you stop this from happening when you're not there? That That's yeah. a concern, right? Well, I told her, uh, first of all, I said, don't call them back. <laughs> I right. sang up the phone, mom, don't call them back. Yep. Uh, and I explained to her that these are almost always scams. So yes. I said, if you're concerned, I said, here's what you do. Get in your car and go to the Verizon store. Right. Right. That that way, you know that, the, the, you know, they're going to take good care of you there. You know, you're dealing with people who actually work for Verizon. <laughs> right. So and my mom is someone who's completely, totally happy to do that. She right. she would love nothing more than a reason to get out of the house and run a little errand. So that would work for her. So we'll see. But it's just a reminder to everybody out there to s- s- spread the word. You know, those those bad guys are out there and anybody can fall for it. And it's uh it's really a shame when you see a loved one in the midst of it. Yeah, it's almost as if this is the same group of people, it seems, isn't it? Well, I don't know. The, the other group was hitting my dad, and this was my right. mom. So, I I mean, I suppose it's possible. I, I suspect, if anything, you know, maybe they have a, a, a list of senior citizens or something like that. To, yeah. They think are more susceptible, but uh, hard Probably to know. the list from the AARP. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, uh, just word to the wise there to uh, be mindful of this. Remind your your elderly friends and family to be on the lookout for these sorts of things because it can happen to anybody. 
All right, well, let's move on to our stories this week. Uh, I'll kick things off for us. Uh, my story this week comes from uh, Naked Security by Sophos. This is written by Paul Ducklin, who's been a guest on our show before. And the article is uh, SMS phishing scam pretends to be Apple chatbot. Don't fall for it. <laughs> so okay. uh, uh, we've talked about SMS phishing before, which sometimes goes by the name smishing because of the S there in SMS. This article outlines a message. Uh, I'll read it here. They they have did a screen capture of it on the Naked Security blog. It says, hello, Christopher. Congratulations. You received an opportunity to be in the testing group for our newest iPhone 12. As part of Apple 2020 testing program, you've been selected as perfect candidate. Click this link for further information. Now, <laughs> what's interesting about the link is the link says www.apple.co.uk slash 2020 promo. Huh. That is a completely legit looking URL. Right? That's correct. The, the naked security is in the UK. So the .co.uk wouldn't raise an eyebrow for folks who are over there. But like, you know, so many of these things, that's what the text looks like. But underneath the hood, it's not going to Apple <laughs> in the UK, right? It's going somewhere completely different. Okay, so um, in SMS, you can now essentially obfuscate the link by putting text over top of it. Yes. I did yes. not know this was possible in SMS. Yes, I believe it is. Yes. Well, I clearly is because they're doing it here. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> right. The article goes on. And if you click through, if you if you decide that you really want to be one of the first people to have one of those uh, Apple iPhone 12s, uh, you click through and it takes you to a website that says, congratulations, here's your chance to get the iPhone 12. It has a timer on it. So, it's, you know, time is running out. You only have two minutes to claim your prize. The old artificial right? time constraint. That's right. That's right. To turn up the heat on you. And then it asks you to uh, fill out some information, your email address, and asks you to verify some information about yourself. And then ultimately, in the end, it asks you for your credit card information, ah. just, uh, for, uh, just for a modest shipping fee to receive the iPhone 12 for a modest fee to right. receive it. And of course, because if Apple's going to run a beta program, the one thing they can't afford is the shipping cost to send you your free iPhone 12. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Apple, who has <laughs> all the money, <laughs> they right. literally have all the money. I think they're the most cash flush company ever to have existed, aren't they? I believe that is correct. Yes, yeah. they are sitting on a mountain, a bigger mountain of money than the dragon in in uh, the Hobbit. So, <laughs> so um, oh, as how sad is it you make that reference, and then I I know I get it to name the dragon. Well, <laughs> yeah, the, the truth hurts, Joe. So, yes. uh, the, as they say in this article. Uh, what to do? First and foremost, there is no free iPhone. Right. There's absolutely. never, there's never, never a, free is a free iPhone. iPhone. No, no. That's a ruse. Uh, yes, they're taking advantage of of greed, perhaps even a little bit of techno lust. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, they say keep your eyes open for clues. Um, there are some spelling errors and and things like that that are in this message that could yeah, be there's a, a tell. A grammatical error in here as well. You've been selected as perfect candidate. It's like. Boris Badenoff is writing this. <laughs> right. Look at the link before you click. Again, as we've talked about many times, that's more difficult on a mobile device, but you can click and hold on a link and it will show you the actual link. Uh, but slow down, check, check a link right. before you click. I mean, first off, don't click on the link. Right. Yes. By, but by if no you, means if, you click on the link. If you must click on the link, click and hold and, and see what it is. Uh, and then finally, the Sophos folks say, consider a web filter uh, to help keep the bad stuff out. Things like a, a corporate VPN, uh, you know, filtering on your local network, those sorts of things can be helpful. So uh, interesting article there. Anything jump out to you, Joe, about this? Any comments from you? Well, one of the things that strikes me in this article is that when you click on the link, the very first thing that happens is a bunch of confetti falls down. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, right. it's like some cascading style sheets or JavaScript confetti on the right. web page. That doesn't strike me as something Apple would do. No. Uh, that's very <laughs> un-Apple. Yeah, known for their uh, economy and design, right? Right. <laughs> their clean Apple interfaces. Apple does a really good job. As much as, I, <laughs> as much as I don't like Apple, they do an excellent job on user interface, and that is out of character for them. Yeah, yeah. What you said originally sticks with me, that there is no free iPhone. This is just something that's too good to be true. And I will confess to this, Dave, mm. that techno lust you mentioned 
is a hook for me. If somebody <laughs> were to call me up or, or contact me and go, hey, do you want this free new gadget? I'd be like, yeah, I do. I, <laughs> I really I do, do want, want that, that free new gadget. gadget but maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe I should think about this a little bit better. Right, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm certainly following that for myself. All right. Well, again, uh, that's uh, from the folks over at Naked Security, the Sophos blog. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. That is my story this week. Joe, what do you have for us? Dave, it's that time of the cycle again. What do I say about getting your political news from social media? Ah, yes. I know this. Don't do it. That's right. Don't do it. And the main <laughs> reason I say this is because by their very nature, these services are not conducive to political discourse or even to your own political thought. Their hmm. algorithms isolate you in this echo chamber, and they only show you the things that they know will get you to stay on the page or in the app. That's what they're designed to do because that's their business model. It, their mm-hmm. business model is dependent upon you looking at the screen. And if, if right. they can keep you looking at the screen, they're going to keep you looking at the screen. And if they show you political information from your friends or even ads that you either agree with or disagree with, depending on how you will react, they're going to show you that. Yeah, it's so, all about engagement. It's all about engagement, right. But the second most important reason that I tell people not to use these platforms for your as sources for political information is that they are vulnerable to exploitation. And today I have another fine example of why you don't trust anything political on a social network. Taylor Hatmaker over at TechCrunch is reporting Facebook has taken down two networks of fake accounts. Facebook and Graphica, uh, Graphica is a company that specializes in social media disinformation. That's right. There's a company now out there that specializes in, Wait, in social creating media. it? No, no, in, in detecting it. Okay. In, in detecting <laughs> <A> few. it. few. <laughs> no. no, creating it is the job of uh, nation states, Dave. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> right, right, right. This is right. a company that actually has a, a legitimate business model of finding these networks out there. That's how bad this is. This company can survive on that, right? Facebook has taken down over 200 fake accounts, 40 pages, nine groups, and then 27 Instagram accounts. Hmm. One of these networks was run out of China and one was run out of the Philippines. One of the interesting points in this story, and actually the headline of Hatmaker's story, is that the accounts from the Chinese network used images that were generated with Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. We've talked about these before. Basically, it's one machine learning model that generates an image and then passes it to a second machine learning model that tries to detect that it's fake. And if it detects that it's fake, the first model tries again, right? Ah. And it keeps trying until the second network says, this looks like a legitimate picture, and that's the picture they use. If you look at these pictures in Taylor Hatmaker's article, there are nine images, and only one of them looks the least bit off, and it's negligible. It's really, really slight. And the only reason I think I know that it's it's not a real image is because I was told these are fake images. These images look really, really good and convincing. Now, here's what's interesting. The Chinese network started operating in April of 2019. That's over a year ago. That's how long this, this network existed before Facebook took it down for more than a year. You can do a lot of damage in in more than a year. In 2020, they set up three U.S. focus groups. In other words, they were trying to engage United States citizens with these groups. One group was pro-Trump. One group was pro-Biden. And one group that was called Quack Quack, that was anti-Trump. And Hmm. I imagine that they were probably in the process of setting up an anti-Biden group as well. But these guys are trying to play all sides of the die here, not just two sides of the coin. They're going... (laughs) Pro-Trump, pro-Biden, anti-Trump, and probably anti-Biden. They're probably trying to get everything that they can just to put as much political information out there and and to uh, push their propaganda. Of course, they're pushing their agenda, particularly with regard to issues of the South China Sea, which Mm. the Chinese government is very interested in expanding its control over, as we've seen. But these guys existed for over a year before Facebook shut them down. And I guarantee you that is not the only one out there. There's more out there that Facebook just hasn't found yet. There are plenty out there that Twitter hasn't found. Whatever your social media network, these guys are out there on it. So that's why I say do not get your political news from Facebook or any other social media platform. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that uh, with groups like this, and this particular one is coming out of China, but we've seen 
uh, disinformation coming from Russia. We've seen uh, stuff coming from Iran. Uh, there are plenty of other nations that do it. I mean, those are the biggies. It's important to understand that their goal here isn't necessarily to get you to choose one candidate or the other. That's One right. of their primary goals is to just make you feel uncertain about our system. Right. To inject that uncertainty, which is corrosive to us as a nation. That's exactly right. Another goal that they have is just to get us to dislike each other enough that we start hating each other based mm -hmm. solely on our political biases or political mm -hmm. beliefs. And frankly, I'm speaking as an American here, but that's just un-American, right? right? One of the things we've always had in this country is tolerance for other people's political beliefs. And recently that has not been the case. And I, I believe that it is in large part due to foreign meddling in our, in our political system. And you're right. The goal is not to get one person elected over the other. The, the goal, particularly with regard to Russia, is to just sow political discord. That's mm -hmm. it. Well, let, let, let me ask you this then. If we don't get our political news from Facebook, what do you consider to be a good place? Here's what I recommend. This is something I think is important that you do. Whatever your political leaning, uh, if you lean to the left or lean to the right, you should get your political news from a trusted source on either side of that spectrum. If you lean to the right, you should definitely get your news from a trusted source that you're going to like, but you should also get your news from, a, from another source outside of your political spectrum because they're going to say things that you don't normally think about. There's a great website called allsides.com, which will take an issue and show you news from the left, news from the right, and news from the center. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives you the headlines and then you can click on and read the articles. I think that's a good a good website to start with. But yeah. you have to go with a news source that demonstrates integrity. And that doesn't mean that they say things that you agree with. That means that what they say is true and that you can find them to be trustworthy. There is always going to be bias in your media, period. It's always going to be there. Uh, it's very hard to get that out. But it, you can counteract that by balancing the bias that you receive with uh, bias from the other side. Right. Right. Try to break out of that bubble. That's right. Make a deliberate yeah. effort to break out of the bubble. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, those are our stories for this week. Uh, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Our catch of the day comes from Reddit user SlyFox227, who is lucky enough to be invited to join the Illuminati game. Hmm. Still waiting for my right. invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, it goes like this. Here's the message. Procedure of joining the great Illuminati temple of money, fame, and power. Join Illuminati today and get all you have ever wanted to become. Are you a businessman, a woman, politician, musician, student, footballer? Do you want to be rich, famous, powerful, and protected in life? Or to be amongst those that matter in our society today? What do you seek for in life? Then take this step and get it all today. Illuminati is free for all, and we don't take blood sacrifice. All we need from each member is to follow the rules and regulations that make us who we are today in the world. The Illuminati Brotherhood has many to achieve after becoming a member. A lot of benefits await you now. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Are you saying that Arnold is a member of the uh, Illuminati Day? Is that what that is? <laughs> Get to the chopper. <laughs> My favorite part is that they, they don't take blood sacrifices. Well, it's good. I mean, yeah. who among I'm, us I'm hasn't relieved. been in a group that requires blood sacrifice? Yeah, I, I say right. it's a breath it's a breath of fresh air to not have to join a group that requires a blood <laughs> sacrifice, right? Indeed. <laughs> All right. I, I don't what what is what's the goal here, Joe? What's the end game? <laughs> I have no idea what the end game is here, Dave. This this is probably just a to collect information, I don't know. Maybe they're actually going to try to get you to pay some money. Maybe this is the opening of a scam where they just say, okay, your membership fees are uh, are due and it's $1,000 a year. Right. And now you're a member of the <laughs> Illuminati. Yes. <laughs> Everything you've ever wanted. Right. All right. Well, that's a good one. Uh, thanks to uh, Reddit user SlyFox227 uh, for sharing that. That is our catch of the day. And now back to that question we asked earlier about training. Our sponsors at Know Before want to spring you from that break room with New School Security Awareness Training. They've got the world's largest security awareness training library, and its content is always fresh. 
Know Before delivers interactive, engaging training on demand. It's done through the browser and supplemented with frequent simulated social engineering attacks by email, phone, and text. Pick your categories to suit your business. Operate internationally. Know Before delivers convincing, real-world proven templates in 24 languages. And wherever you are, be sure to stay on top of the latest news and information to protect your organization with Know Before's weekly Cyber Heist News. We read it, and we think you'll find it valuable, too. Sign up for Cyber Heist News at knowbefore.com slash news. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash news. All right, Joe, you know, I, I recently uh, had the pleasure of speaking with Alice Mosher from a company called Mobile Iron. And what sparked our conversation was the folks at Mobile Iron sent me a package that I received in the mail. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm not going to give too much of the story away because we talk about it in the interview, but uh, here's my conversation with Alex Mosher. Setting the table here, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago now, I received a package in the mail which I had actually gotten a heads up that a package would be coming, so I was prepared for it. When I opened this package, uh, inside was a box full of delicious cookies, and there was a note from uh, you and your team at Mobile Iron, and it said, uh, sometimes our curiosity gets the best of us. Enjoy this sweet treat. Can you describe to us uh, what was in that box of cookies? Sure, absolutely. So you had, obviously, the, the cookies... And then on each of the cookies, we went ahead and put a QR code. Uh, And the reason that we did that is, as you know, we've certainly seen uh, as a result of the pandemic going on, a lot of contactless interaction with various systems, go back to a restaurant, oftentimes the menu is on a QR code, uh, or you get a receipt or a bill and you're using a QR code, or you're checking out at a service or maybe even an, an online system, maybe even folks that used to bill you in person, uh, now maybe they're sending you an email and that has an embedded QR code in it. Uh, so QR codes have become really relevant in our lives and certainly I think amplified as part of the whole pandemic that uh, we've been uh, going through and managing through. Uh, so what we did was we took a box of great cookies, something uh, everybody would, as you mentioned, love to have, and we put a <laughs> QR code on it, incentivizing you to hopefully your curiosity get the best of you. And, yes. uh, and get you to go ahead and scan that QR code. Now, the gotcha point with our QR code was it directed you to a site that uh, very easily could have been a phishing site or a malicious site of sorts just to kind of get you thinking about, whoa, I don't even think about when I go to those examples I gave before, the restaurant, the bill, the wherever it might be, and I just maybe blindly scan things like QR codes with my mobile device because it's so easy to do and, and it makes life certainly much simpler especially in the current times. Yeah, and I did exactly that. Uh, I, and now, and granted, I, you know, I knew that this was coming and, uh, and I had a certain amount of trust uh, in both the team at Mobile Iron and the PR team. And because I'd been warned ahead of time that this was coming, it wasn't out of the blue. So I had fairly high confidence that nothing bad was going to happen. But uh, when I, when I uh, used the QR code and went through to that uh, page, it, it gave me a, a sort of a good-natured sort of... Uh, you know, a slap on the wrist that, hey, this could have been bad. And, uh, and then it was a nice educational page about all the, all the things that uh, you need to look out for. You know, one thing that struck me with this is that, you know, like, for example, when I go to buy gas, there's a big poster there next to the gas pump. And sometimes the gas pumps themselves have QR codes on them that say, right. pay with your mobile device, use this QR code. Yep. Well, what's to keep a, a bad actor from printing out a sticker that looks like, for all purposes, it belongs there. Yep. That would then send you somewhere bad. Yes. Actually, it's a it's a really great point. And if you think about it, a few years ago, you remember there was a whole big warning that before you go to uh, an ATM, even at a known bank, you're supposed to kind of like pull on the card thing to make sure that it, it doesn't just pop off as a, right. as a bad card reader, right? That's just reading your, your credit card number. QR code, let's face it, you and I can go build a QR code on a printer, even put it on a nice sticker, we're, we're there at the gas station. Usually there's no longer a gas attendant that's outside watching what you're doing. There's absolutely yep. nothing in those scenarios to do that. Think about the person who maybe used my restaurant example again. I leave a restaurant, a stick of news. All those are stickers anyways. How do you know whether that's the one the restaurant intended or not? I could even make it look like a restaurant web page, maybe take me about 10 minutes on YouTube to find out how to spoof something that looks like that 
restaurant or that gas station's page. So it pops up on your device. You're like, wait, this looks legitimate. Let me just enter in uh, my credentials and go. And by the way, if you don't think that actually happens, if you just dissect what happened just a matter of weeks ago with Twitter and the big hack that happened there, what one of the main ways that they were able to fish uh, folks' emails was they made a landing page that looked like a legitimate Twitter landing page for internal employees. So when they went to the page, they didn't look at the URL. They just looked at the page and said, this looks legit, username, mm -hmm. password, and the whole rest of it is uh, is history. So what are your recommendations here? How, what, what are some of the best ways that uh, both people and organizations can protect themselves from this sort of thing? So I think you have to think about phishing in a very different way than, than we've traditionally thought about, it, right? The problem has been around for 20 plus years, certainly from uh, an email perspective, really as soon as, as internet-based email, maybe 30 years ago, was really uh, consumed by large organizations, you know, phishing and spam was uh, was a problem. Uh, it's certainly gotten far more sophisticated over the last 30 years, and we've gotten decently good at protecting, you know, kind of our traditional corporate email sources. And the hackers know that, right? They know that that we're trying to fish your traditional corporate email is uh, is a relatively challenging thing to do. But if you think about other sources of communication, you know, email in a lot of ways is sort of that very legacy, maybe even you can argue a dying platform from a communication perspective, even in the business world. A lot mm -hmm. of people are using things like social media to, uh, to communicate. Certainly as you go younger, uh, that's more and more common. They're using applications like if they have an iPhone, iMessage, SMS, WhatsApp, right? All of those sources. Oftentimes, if you have email, you don't just have one email account, especially on your mobile device. You might have a personal email account or more than one personal email account. Uh, you certainly got many different ways of communicating with friends and colleagues and others. So I think it's really important that we look at trying to protect ourselves kind of holistically. Think about the platform that people are using and the different sources of communication that could potentially be utilized to fish just like the QR code uh, example you and I just uh, just discussed. Yeah, you know, one thing that struck me in my own uh, experience with the cookies that you all sent out was that, you know, I think it's the default in iOS that when you have your camera app open and it sees a QR code, it automatically sort of triggers it and it, it, yes. it says, hey, do you want me to open this? Uh, you can disable that, but, uh, you know, that that's a, that, there's an issue, I could take issue with that itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and if you think about it, there are legitimate good sources, like use the gas pump example you gave. It certainly makes life a whole lot more convenient, right? Could mm -hmm. you imagine today with the challenges, like I gave the restaurant example, restaurants are under enough pressure just to, uh, to stay afloat. If they had to literally reprint menus every single time somebody came into the restaurant because they have to throw them away because of the pandemic, costs would go up and it would be even more stress on uh, on the organization. So there's really positive things that are on the front end. Think about, you know, the communication platforms we have, the ability to quickly just communicate with all kinds of people on platforms like SMS and, and iMessage and WhatsApp and, and the sort. So because these systems are, are so great and they benefit us so greatly, it's what really puts them at such easy target from a hacker's perspective, because they know that, that you're doing things in, in quick real time. You're not really paying super close attention to what's happening. You, you're there at that location, you get the cookie, you scan it, you're, you're thinking something good is is uh, is the result, and uh, only to find out that uh, you know something bad has happened at the end of the day. And again, you don't have to go even far back in history. I'll reference again that Twitter attack. A lot of this was sort of done that same way, using systems that were put in place to make life easier and more convenient. We focused more on the convenient side than we did the security side. You really have to find the balance between the two. Yeah. And as this proves, uh, a surefire way to get uh, through someone's defenses is is directly through their stomachs. Yes, <laughs> there's no no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, there's been a huge uptick in phishing on mobile devices, in excess of fifty percent, and uh, and it's for all the reasons that we talked about, right? The convenience factor, uh, the ease of of getting to a user's data and information, and the fact that you've got this very small screen with very limited real estate. And so things like validating links before you click on them are often very difficult. You get that tiny little bit.ly link or an abbreviated link. So you're not really sure what you're clicking on before you're clicking on it. Those challenges continue to really drive 
the need to look at protecting yourself in those outer you know, endpoints from a fishing perspective. All right, Joe, what do you think? Dave, I have one question. Yes. Where are my cookies? <laughs> Your cookies are in my belly. <laughs> <laughs> I, they were they were delicious cookies, Joe. Were I they ate, addressed I ate to them all. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were not. They were addressed okay. to me. But I, I should have. You're right. It was it was uh, it was rude of me and selfish to not share these scammy cookies with you. <laughs> were the QR codes actually printed on the cookies? Yes, they were. They were. Really? You can. If you want to go digging back in my Twitter account, which is at Bitnery, I've, I posted some pictures of them. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll they're like, you know, flat shortbread cookies. They're, they're quite tasty. They had icing on them and, and printed on, with, with, on the icing because, you know, they can, they can dot matrix print on, on baked goods now. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's, right. that's what they did Here's here. Here's a vector none of us expected. <laughs> I'm sorry, ink, inkjet print, not dot matrix. Ink, right. Inkjet print, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, yeah, you dot matrix print, you wind up with a pile of crumbs at the end. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm familiar with QR codes and barcodes from my time in my failed sales career as selling printers, uh, in particular barcode printers and uh, multiplex barcode printers. But a QR code is a matrix barcode, and that's all it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's nothing different than the technology that you use at the grocery store to check out with a UPC on the bottom, except that... While a UPC is read in one dimension, a QR code is read in two dimensions. And there are some features in the QR code that tell whatever's reading it how to orient the image and what version of the QR code you're looking at. It's all very interesting. A QR code can hold up to 4,000 characters of information. That's, that's a lot hmm. of data in a little bitty spot. And <laughs> That's more memory than my first computer. Right. <laughs> that's, that's about as much memory as my first computer had. Uh, <laughs> It's all 4K. You, your first computer had to have more than 4K. It did, but uh, the screen, the uh, video display took up about half of that. So you were right. left with about two and a half K. Of, but, yeah. we, but we digress. Right. <laughs> a, a, old men talking about their old computers. Uh, <laughs> if it's a URL, the app, like your camera app on your iPhone or your Android, may just open that up. And I think you said in the interview that your, your phone just opened that URL up. Most people don't think about this as a vector. I do because I'm paranoid and steeped in the information security field, right? So <laughs> this is one of the things I think about. But on my phone, I have an app from Trend Micro that reads QR codes and then vets the website that they point to and tells hmm. you whether or not it's safe to go to it or not. And I, I recommend that if you're going to use your phone to open QR codes that you use one of these apps. QR codes are a, a vector and you should absolutely not trust the QR code that you're looking at when you see it because like you and, and Alex said in the interview, that's easy just to print one out and put a sticker over top of the existing QR code and replace it with a malicious one. So right. use some kind of vetting system like the app I was talking about earlier and just be careful. Everything out there that has a legitimate purpose can also be used maliciously. Yep, and never underestimate the ability of tasty baked goods That's to right. penetrate your your security. <laughs> your, multi, <laughs> your defense in depth is out the window when cookies are involved. That's right. So, <laughs> all right. Well, our thanks to Alex Mosher for uh, joining us, and thanks to the folks at Mobile Iron and their PR folks as well for uh, sharing that campaign with us. So it was it was a lot of fun, but also I think some good lessons to share. So it's uh, good for everybody. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. And of course, we want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.